Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 6. And in just a moment, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Revelation chapter 6. We have been out of Revelation for the last two weeks because of Palm Sunday and also Easter Sunday. We talked about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's at the very heart of the gospel. That is the gospel. And uh, now we get back to Revelation. We're preaching through the book of Revelation here at Bellevue on Sunday mornings in 2020. And this is an exciting time. It is also a very sobering time because today we enter into the Great Tribulation. When I was a young boy, my father took me to the outskirts of Ripley, Tennessee in Lauderdale County, where I grew up uh, in Dyersburg, north of there. I grew up in, in Dyersburg, and we went to Ripley, Tennessee, went out in Lauderdale County where his uncle lived, and I rode a horse. It was a big horse, at least that's the way I remember it. I was a little guy back then. And I got on that horse and was riding, and all of a sudden, that big, strong horse saw the barn and saw my uncle, who was his master, and he bolted, the, the, the horse literally bolted toward the barn. And he was running wide open, and I, the reins fell out of my hands, and I was just holding on to his mane. And he stopped, and I kept going, and I fell into the barn and uh, on the side wall upside down and came down with a thud. I have never, I don't think, wanted to be on another horse in my life. It was so traumatic to me as a young child. That horse was running full speed, and he was strong. When I think about that, I think about how strong these four horsemen are going to be. This morning we enter into the Great Tribulation, the part of Revelation that is talking about the most horrible time on this earth. It's the most horrific time that's ever going to take place on the planet earth. The Great Tribulation is literally seven years like we have never known. 2,555 days of hell on earth. For seven years, this earth will barely have enough light to see and barely have enough food to feed a few, relatively few people with starvation wages. The Great Tribulation will make COVID-19 pandemic look like a cakewalk. As of today, on the 19th of April, 2020, COVID-19 deaths total a little over 160,000 deaths worldwide. That's over several months. To put that in perspective, in the Great Tribulation, there could be easily over 100,000 people that die every day, and even more. It could be up to a million people a day die on planet Earth in that seven-year period. They would die every day. Just imagine the magnitude of what I'm trying to share with you. The Great Tribulation begins with these vicious four horsemen of the apocalypse. They bring deception, destruction, that is war, and then deprivation and death. And when the first white horse rides, the great tribulation is launched and there's no turning back. It will be the beginning of the end. Look at Revelation chapter 6. First thing we see are four fearsome riders. Four fearsome riders. In Revelation 6, we see the judgments of the great tribulation starting to come out. Literally, out of the gate, literally, four fearsome horses and their riders. When you say the phrase, four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know that you're talking about something that is notorious and horrific. Just to say the words, bring fear. These four riders, deception, destruction through war, deprivation through famine, and death through disease and other means, they're going to ride openly across the world during this horrific age. The Old Testament prophet talked about the Great Tribulation. Jeremiah talked about it when he said in Jeremiah 30 verse 7, 
In all history, there has never been such a time of terror. It will be a time of trouble for my people, Israel. Yet in the end, they will be saved. Likewise, the Old Testament prophet Joel, which his name means Jehovah is God, described the great tribulation. He said in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Sound the alarm in Jerusalem. Raise the battle cry on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. It is a day of darkness, remember that, and gloom. A day of thick clouds and deep blackness. One of the ways you'll know it's the great tribulation, it's always going to be barely enough light just to be able to see. And then it says, thick clouds of deep darkness, suddenly like dawn spreading across the mountains, a great and mighty army appears. And then he says, nothing like it has been seen before or will ever be seen again. Now, for those people that believe that Revelation was talking about history in time past, I'm sorry, but the great tribulation is going to be so bad, it's like nothing the world has ever seen. Revelation is prophetic. It's talking about the future. It's not talking primarily about the past. And then the Old Testament prophet Daniel said this about the great tribulation in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the archangel, who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people, talking about the Jewish people, whose name is written in the book, of book, will be rescued. And then Jesus himself talked about the Great Tribulation. Not only did he talk about it, he gave it the name Great Tribulation in a chapter that talks about eschatology, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 in the New American Standard says this, For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. I like what the New Living Translation says there in Matthew 24, 21, for there will be a greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. Now for months, our world has endured COVID-19, this pandemic. Indeed, it's been a gloomy, wretched experience. Over 2 million reported cases worldwide. Worldwide, over 150,000 deaths. In America, just under 700,000 cases reported. 35,000 deaths thus far. The curve is beginning to flatten, but COVID-19 is still here. With COVID-19, Again, 150,000 have died in a matter of months. But again, I want to remind you in the Great Tribulation, that would easily be a one-day death toll during the 2,555 days of the Great Tribulation, the seven years of the Great Tribulation. More people will die in one day than all the people have died worldwide already with COVID-19. To give you some perspective. This is the beginning of the end. Who are these fearsome riders? What do they represent? The first horseman is deception. Look at verses 1 and 2 in Revelation chapter 6. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals. You might remember back in chapter 5 of Revelation, the only one that was worthy in heaven to break these seals was the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now He is opening these seals, and as he does, Jesus unleashes the wrath of God on this earth. He's already taken out his people. He's already taken out the Holy Spirit. What will the world be like without Christians and without the restraining power and presence of the Holy Spirit? It will literally be the great tribulation, a time of seven years of hell on earth. He said, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. I looked and behold, a white horse. Now, tip typically, when you see someone on a white horse or when you see someone wearing white in the book of Revelation, it reminds you of God's righteousness. But this rider 
is deceptively clothed in white. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's on a white horse. Notice he is holding something. Bible says he who sat on it had a bow. That is a weapon of battle. But notice he doesn't have any arrows. He just has the bow. That's because he will be victorious by means of peaceful deception. His white presence will pose him as an agent of peace. But it's all pretense. It's all a blatant act of deception. He is, his ride will promise peace, but he will actually usher in war. It says, and a crown was given to him. The rider will become a leader wearing a Stephanos, a crown that was given to somebody who was victorious in an athletic event or in a war on earth. You might remember that Jesus Christ in heaven, Revelation 19 verse 12 says, will wear not a Stephanos, but a diademe. And it is where we get the word, word diadem. It is for a king and it is a heavenly crown. But this one is wearing an earthly crown, a Stephanos. And uh, will this rider in white, will he be crowned? Yes. Why is he going to be crowned? He's going to be domineering and deceiving over other people. It says he will go out conquering and to conquer. Now, who is the rider? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. It's certainly not Christ. It's the Antichrist. He's the ultimate crooked politician. Now, every politician is not crooked, but many are. But in this day, you're going to see the most crooked politician ever, the Antichrist. And as we approach the end of time, I believe many more politicians will be filled with the spirit of Antichrist, and they will be deceptive. They will wear white robes on the outside, but they'll be filled with deception on the inside. They will deceptively pave the way for the deception of the Antichrist himself. Now, I want to speak about something. When I think of political deception, I immediately think about socialism. We're hearing a lot about socialism as a preferred political paradigm. But socialism has its roots in humanistic atheism. It was founded by a man named Karl Marx, an avowed atheist who referred to religion as the opium, that is the drug of the masses, the opium of the people. Marx did not believe that individuals should own anything in their own name, no possessions, no property. Only the state, only the government should own property and possessions. To own your own home, to own your own car, that is not a socialistic value. Instead, the state is God. It owns everything. Workers are to work, but they're to work for the common good of the state, not for rewarding themselves. Economic rewards for labor should be the same for everybody. In socialism, the ideal is an absolute welfare state. Socialism punishes diligent workers by taking their earnings and unrightfully giving those earnings to the government for a broader distribution. Some misleadingly say that Jesus advocated socialism. Jesus and the early Christians were not socialist. Indeed, early on in the book of Acts, the first Christians did pool their money to meet the needs of their needy brothers and sisters. But it was not something that was coerced upon them. It was voluntary. You didn't have to participate. It was voluntary, and it was also temporary. By the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, people possess land. They have other possessions. They have property. 
This was not socialism. This was generosity. And there's a big difference. Yes, I believe in generosity, but I don't believe in mandatory socialism. Socialism is not voluntary. It is governmentally enforced, and it is certainly not temporary. It is unjustly permanent. Socialism spawns dictators. It it does not spawn benevolent leaders. It produces slaves to the state, not thrifty, wholesome, law-abiding citizens. Socialism has a twin cousin, communism, and they both deceptively wear white robes just like the first horseman. Now, I'm not saying that the first horseman is socialism. I am saying that socialism is like the spirit of Antichrist. The first horseman is the Antichrist, but he will come in with ideologies like socialism, like communism, deceptive ideologies will be commonplace and they'll ride and they will say peace, prosperity for all. But then before long, they will show their deceptive colors. This first horseman is already, you can already hear his hoofbeats. He's the antichrist, the fearsome rider of deception. Who is the second horseman? He is destruction. Look at verses three and four when he Broke the, when Jesus broke the second seal. I heard the second living creature saying, Come, unlike the first horseman, this horseman will display no deception. He will be brazenly blatant about his mission. He is coming to cause war. Look at verse 4. And another, a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it, It was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. The red horse, symbolic, obviously, of bloodshed, of war. The rider rode for this purpose, to take peace from the earth. Men would slay one another. Think of all the wars that this world has ever endured already. But the great tribulation will be total war. It will be every day, everywhere, for all of the years of the Great Tribulation. A great sword will be given to him. What is that great sword? Well, we don't know. I personally believe it's nuclear weapons. It's a great sword, a mega sword, if you will. And it will literally wreak havoc on this earth. And you know what? In America, we've only had just a very few wars fought on our land, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War. But when it comes to world war, it was not fought on American soil, except for what happened at Pearl Harbor in 1941, December the 7th. But it wasn't fought anywhere else on our soil. But in the World War III, if if you will, the, the time of the tribulation that's coming, it's going to be war everywhere. You're not going to be able to escape it. It's going to happen wherever you are, On this planet, there will be a great sword. It will be the bloodiest battles ever fought on this earth. It will involve every nation and every one. And we'll see later in Revelation 6, at the end of the chapter, there will be no place to hide, even though people seek seclusion. The Bible says that a red horse is coming. World War III, if you will, the second horseman, is destruction. And what follows the destruction of war? That is the third horseman, deprivation, lack of means, lack of provision. Look at verse 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come, and a new horseman appears. He said, I looked and behold a black horse, and he who set on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Notice he said, behold, it was so startling to John. John, this old man, almost a hundred years old on the island of Patmos, seeing this vision, he sees this black horse. He says, behold, whoa. And all of a sudden he starts seeing something. This man on this horse, 
is holding scales for the purpose of measuring. And then a voice explained why the rider held the scales. Verse 6, I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, now listen, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, do not damage the oil and the wine. The wine's going to be okay. The oil's going to be okay for right now. Now, later on, it'll all be damaged. But right now, the attack is on the grain. And he said it, the famine is going to be so severe that it's going to cost a denarius for one quart of wheat. What is a denarius? It was what people received for a single day of work. The wages of one day for one man was a denarius, and he would get a little quart of wheat, barely enough to survive. You say, well, why didn't you just go down at Kroger and get whatever he wants? Listen to me. If you think the shelves are empty now, you haven't seen it. There won't be anything in the grocery stores. There won't be any shops with any food available. It's going to be measured out in quarts. And he says, one quart, just enough for one man to barely survive. Starvation wages. You're going to work all day long and not a little eight-hour shift either. 12, 16 hours a day, you're going to work just to be able to survive. You say, well, what if he's got a family? Well, he's got to go to the second option. A quart of wheat for a denari denarius. And then he says, three quarts of barley for a denarius. What is that talking about? Barley is a substandard grain, and it was going to be available for the same price. You get three times as much for the same price, a denarius. You'll work all day to be able to get three little cupfuls, if you will, a little quart of barley. It's what they fed the hogs with. It's what they fed the animals with. It was substandard wheat. It was substandard grain. And so if you've got a family, you've got to go out and your wife's got to go work out and you've all got to work enough just to eat substandard food, just to barely make it. Do you understand that he's talking about lack of provision? Again, we think it's bad now. We, we think it's terrible. We can't find any paper products. We can't find paper towels. We can't find tissues. We can't find toilet paper. Look, <laughs> that means nothing compared to what's coming. We're talking about no food. We're talking about no meat. We're talking about no vegetables. We're talking about barely getting by with wheat and barley. The third horseman is deprivation. Well, the white horseman of political deception will lead to the red horse of destructive war that will lead to the black horse of deprivation and inadequate provision. And really, after these three ride, there's only one horse that can ride, the fourth, fourth horseman of death. Look at verses 7 and 8. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. The fourth horseman now enters with the logical outcome. Look at verse 8. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. Why was he ashen? Why was he the color of pale gray? Because of his name. Look. See who it is. He who sat on it had the name death. Death. Death follows deprivation of provision. Death follows destruction of war. Death follows political deception. In the great tribulation, people are going to die in mass daily. There will be heaps of corpses. I have been to Cambodia in the killing fields where those communists and socialists killed three million people. If you had a high school education, you were killed in Cambodia because you were deemed dangerous to the state. They killed people. I've seen those bones stacked up because there was no place to bury them. That's what we're talking about worldwide, worldwide. He who sat on it had the name death. And notice who was following death. Hades. 
Hades was following with him. After death, Hades was coming behind to pick up the dead bodies. Hades, the grave, is coming back. He's scooping up. He's the grave digger. He, he's scooping up these bodies. He's taking their souls and throwing them into hell. And he's following behind death. It's one of the most vivid images in the entire Bible. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth. A fourth of the earth to kill with four ways. The sword, famine, pestilence, pandemics, and by wild beasts of the earth. The sword. Every day there's going to be unrestricted violence. People will just burst into your home, kill you, eat whatever they want, take whatever they want, and walk out every day. There's going to be worldwide war. Everybody's going to be involved in the war. Then there's not only going to be the sword, but famine, leaving a wake of destruction, scorched farms, closed businesses. You say, oh, it's so bad. Listen, it's going to be worse than COVID-19. These stores that are closed, that's horrible, that's bad. But listen to me. It's nothing compared to what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. I believe that this COVID-19 is actually a birth pang telling us to wake up because worse things are on their way if we don't repent and get right with God. The Great Tribulation will make what we're going through now look like nothing. We will think that this would be a vacation compared to the Great Tribulation. Famine. Shortages of food and all supplies, gasoline, all that stuff, gone. And then there'll be not only sword and famine, but they'll be killed by pestilence, pandemics, epidemics, and then wild beasts. You know, when we think of wild beasts, we think about lions and tigers and those kind of things, bears, whatever, snakes. But you know what? Do you know a little rodent, like a rat, they kill more people than any other beast in the world with their diseases. And I believe that there are going to be so many rats and rodents running. That's one of the ways that disease, disease is going to be spread during the Great Tribulation. Did you know you can kill 95% of the rats that are in your area, and within one year, they'll all be back. They reproduce so quickly. Rats, I believe, are the kind of beast that he's talking about here. And when the great tribulation begins, a fourth of the people on earth are going to die. Let's just do a little math. There are approximately 7.8 million, billion rather, people on this earth. 7.8 billion. A billion is a thousand million. I'm talking about 7.8. Let's say a fourth of them are taken up to heaven. Let's say... Two billion are taken. Now, I don't bit more believe there are two billion born-again Christians on this earth than, than anything. But let's just be very generous just for the sake of generosity. Let's say a fourth of the people get raptured out. That leaves behind, obviously, 5.8 billion people. 5.8 billion people. If a fourth of them are killed at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, how many is that? 1.45, almost one and a half billion people will be killed at the very beginning of the Great Tribulation. Wow. They're going to be killed, and they're going to be killed by sword, by famine, by pestilence, pandemics, wild beasts. There'll be so many that you won't be able to bury them. These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Deception, destruction, deprivation, death. They're ready to ride. All God has to do is let them out of the gate, and they will ride. No politician, no army can delay them or detain them. No one can stop them once they ride. Their fearsome riding will be the beginning of the end. They are the fearsome riders. Well, let's look secondly at some faithful martyrs very quickly. Immediately, we're transformed transported to a heavenly altar. And we see a special group of Christian martyrs that are under the altar of God. They are persecuted martyrs. Look at verse 9. 
When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Now, I want to say this to you. Christians will be persecuted while we're on this earth. The Bible promises that. If we vote in socialism in November, I think we're going to have a lot of persecution with Christians being persecuted in America in the coming years. I'm praying that we will not vote in socialism. I'm praying that we will continue to remain in capitalism. Now, capitalism is not necessarily a Bible way of doing things, but it is a free way of doing things, and Jesus advocates freedom. Socialism is the opposite of freedom. Capitalism brings freedom to people. But nevertheless, martyrs are going to take place before the great tribulation, before the rapture, but after the rapture, there are going to be some people who had heard the gospel that had never gotten saved, and immediately they're going to know what happened. They'd heard about the rapture, they'd heard about the coming of Christ, and they're going to get saved in the great tribulation, at the beginning of the great tribulation. But many of them will be martyred, and these martyred souls that we're seeing are people who got martyred in the great tribulation. And they got martyred because they were proclaiming the Word of God and because they had a testimony and they maintained it. Again, Jesus said, if you love me, the world's going to hate you. John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus also said, you're blessed if people hate you because of me. Matthew 5, 10, one of the Beatitudes, blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Paul said plainly, if you're a Christian, you're living for God, you're really turned on to the Lord, you're going to be persecuted. Acts 14, 22, he said, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, that's not the great tribulation. That's just regular tribulation. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And then he said in 2 Timothy 3, 12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Before the rapture, before the great tribulation, people are going to be persecuted. And people are also going to be martyred. But listen, after the rapture and in the great tribulation, multitudes of Christians who get saved will be martyred. And they'll be slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony that they will maintain. Persecuted martyrs that die in the great tribulation under the altar are faithful and they're passionate. They're, they're, they're persecuted. Now also, they are passionate martyrs passionate martyrs. Look at verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice. They're in heaven and they're, they're loud. I want to say this to you. If you don't like loud, don't die. It is loud in heaven. They are praising God with loud voices in heaven. It is also loud in hell. If you don't like loud, don't die. These people were crying out with a loud voice. They were shouting. They were talking to God saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, they're worshiping Him, even while they're crying out and complaining. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell in the earth? It's like the imprecatory Psalms. They're asking God to avenge them. They did not take vengeance on their enemies, but they know that God is just and He's righteous. They know that the judge of all the earth will do right. And they're passionately praying for Him to avenge them. They understood Deuteronomy 32, 35, where God said, vengeance is mine and retribution in due time. Their foot will slip for the day of their calamity is near, God says, and the impending things are hastening upon them. They knew that. They knew that Paul had predicted that in Romans 12 and 19. He quoted that verse from Deuteronomy 32. Paul said, never take your own revenge. He's talking to Christians. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written. And here he quotes it, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. They knew that, and they were praying a promise of God back to God who made the promise that he would avenge his people who had been done wrong by people on this earth. God will avenge. God will vindicate those who have been persecuted and martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They are passionate martyrs, and they are also patient martyrs. Look at verse 11. There was given to them, each of them, a white robe. Now this does represent the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. The beautiful scene here displays the tenderness of God. God just puts a white robe around him and says, I love you. You were martyred for me. You kept your testimony. I love you. Rest just a little while longer. Oh, God is so tender. Jesus is so righteous. And then notice the others, that others were to be saved in the future, but they would be martyred as well. Until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. When the rapture comes, all the Christians are going to be taken up. The Holy Spirit will leave the world. The church will leave the world. And it will literally be seven years of horrific hell on earth. The world thinks that they don't want the church. But I want to tell you something. Without the restraint of the Holy Spirit of God in the church, this world is going to be in the great tribulation. And during that time, There are going to be some people that are going to get saved, but every one of them will be martyred for their faith. The cruelty of the people left behind will be even worse than it is now. If Jesus returns today, ask yourself, will I be taken up? These martyrs will be persecuted. They're going to be passionate, but God tells them to be patient. He will avenge and vindicate them. So at the beginning of the end, the beginning of the great tribulation, there will be four fearsome riders, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the rider of deception, the rider of destruction, the rider of deprivation, the rider of death. There will not only be fearsome riders, but faithful martyrs who are persecuted, passionate, and patient. But then there will be some fearful leaders. Let's look beginning at verse 12 of what God says about the very end of the beginning. The events of the great tribulation will be so terrifying, even the greatest of leaders of mankind will tremble in fear. What will they be fearful of? Two things. They'll be fearful of a rebellious creation. This world, you're talking about climate change, you're talking about climate problems, this world, the, the whole climate is going to revolt because its creator has been spurned for so long. Verse 12, I looked when he broke the sixth seal. The sixth seal in in this is the final seal of judgment because the seventh seal and and the final seal will be introduced in Revelation 8. The seventh contains all the seven trumpets of judgment. This sixth seal will be broken and it will unleash chaos on earth. He said, there will be a great earthquake. The sun became black as a sackcloth made of hair. And the whole moon became like blood. A great earthquake. Seismos megas. An earthquake of mega proportions. That great earthquake will be so devastating. It will send dust up into the sky, in the atmosphere. The sky will be darkened. The sun will go black. It will be so dark, you'll barely be able to see. Just like Joel said in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. There's going to be a darkness that comes over the earth. Just like the darkness that came over the hill of Calvary. There's going to be a supernatural darkness that comes over the earth. And for seven years, you'll barely be able to see the hand in front of you if you hold it out. There's going to be darkness. The sun will go dark. The moon will be Like red blood, the atmosphere will be tainted. And then the Lord will send a meteor shower. Look at verse 13. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind, a mega wind. There's going to be tornadoes. There's going to be hurricanes like never seen before. And he describes that even more vividly in verse 14. The sky was split apart. I was talking about, I believe, tornadoes and hurricanes and straight line winds like we've never seen before, like a scroll when it's been rolled up. And every mountain 
and every island were moved out of their places. Some of you say, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go to our little cabin up in the mountain. <laughs> Listen, it's going to be all shaken down. Your cabin's going to be flattened out up in the mountains. Well, I'll just go down to our little place in the Hawaiian islands. Listen, those islands are going to be flattened. There's no place to hide. There's no place to, to take refuge. No. As we see, they're fearful. These, these big, strong, leading people are fearful of a rebellious, chaotic, catastrophic creation. The Lord will cause the earth's climate to revolt. And that unstable weather will strike fear into world leaders. The earth's leaders will also be fearful of a righteous creator, not just a rebellious creation, but a righteous creator. Look at verse 15 and following. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders, that commanders is a chili arc. A chili arc was a, he was the backbone of the backbone in the Roman legions. He was over a thousand men. He was over 10 centurions. The centurions were strong men. They were brave warriors. They're like sergeants, if you will, in the army. And he was over 10 of them. And he's going to tremble like a little baby. And the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Doesn't matter if you're a high politician or a lowly slave. Everybody's going to be filled with fear in that day. And they'll either want to commit suicide and let the rocks fall upon them, or at least let the rocks hide them from the wrath of God. And verse 16 says, They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne. That's God the Father. And from the wrath of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day, there it is, there it is, <clears throat> the great day, the time of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? You think you're a big shot? Call yourself an atheist? You better remember what God said in Hebrews 10, 31. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Earth's leaders will be fearful of the righteous Creator. Well, can you hear something? I think I hear footprints. I think I hear hoofbeats. Could it be the riders are on their way? Could it be the deceptive spirit of Antichrist? is among us? Is that not what is behind political schemes like communism, socialism, taking away freedom? Is that, can I hear the hoofbeat of war? Do I not understand that there are massive instruments of war that can take out entire cities with one bomb? We've never seen anything like the war that's coming up. It's going to be total war every day, everywhere. Millions are going to be slaughtered. Can I hear those hoofbeats? Can I hear the deprivation? Can I hear the lack of food? Can I hear the lack of clean water? Can I see people working a whole day just to get a little handful of wheat or maybe three handfuls of barley that's not fit to feed an animal? Can I hear the horsemen? Oh, I hear them. I hear them because we're aborting babies and selling their body parts. I just read an article today that said this man came out and he, he confessed, yes, we sold Body parts of babies that we aborted, even some of the babies were alive, and we took the body parts while they were alive. That sounded like something that Hitler and the Nazis did on the Jews in the 1930s and 40s. I hear the hoofbeats, do you? The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the ashen horse. Friend, this is not a time to play games. This is not a time 
And I want to say this to you. I want to go back to something I said. I believe that this pandemic that we're in, I believe it's a warning cry. God is saying, you think this is bad? You think COVID-19 is bad? Oh, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. I'm not, I'm not diminishing. I know people have died. I get it. And I'm sorry about that. But I want to tell you something. This book talks about something that's a lot worse even than COVID-19. Are you ready? I don't want to go through that. I, I pray that you today would say yes to Jesus Christ. There is no way to face the future with confidence unless you know Jesus Christ. Four horsemen are coming. You can't stop them. I can't stop them. Only God can hold them back. I believe if we would repent, I believe this with all of my heart, if we would repent and have a true revival, we would repent of our sins and cry out to God, God have mercy, I believe. He would extend the time. Give us more time to tell people about Jesus so more people can get saved. That's what I'm praying for. <clears throat> but without that, I don't see anything to hold those four horses back. I can hear them, their hoof beats even now, every day. When I hear about more and more people going into different lives of sexual immorality, I see the home crumbling before our eyes. How can we say that God is not going to send Jesus back at any moment. Are you ready? If not, would you pray to receive Christ today? Would you pray and invite Christ to come to you? Would you surrender your life to Jesus Christ? If ever, oh, ever there's a time to get right with God, now is the time. Now is the time. He's already giving us birth pangs with pandemics. He's saying, is this what you want? The only thing holding back all that I've talked about today is the sovereign hand of God. Would you receive Christ today? If so, would you just bow with me in prayer and pray and invite Christ to come into your life and repent of your sins? Pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. <coughs> I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn to you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You paid my sin debt. I believe you were buried. You really died. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're alive. I receive you right now. I repent. I believe and I receive. I receive you into my life. Save me, Lord Jesus. I give you my life. Save me right now, Lord Jesus Christ. And help me to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name.